I thought Aaron's presentation was really good, and uh, there's a couple of places that I'm going to try specifically to connect to it. And then I also hope there's some issues on Q&A we can get to that I don't have time to, to tease out, but I think that she's raised. But because it was so good, what I'd like to do from a, a housekeeping point of view is right next to my name, if you could just take your out and mark excellent. <laughs> get it off your mind and just put it, put it to the side, and you know, we're all, we'll all be good. Uh, so what the forum asked me to do is to um, explain the GME environment in Medicare to you in terms of, you know, funding and, and that type of thing. And then uh, several years ago, you know, with some uh, degree of frustration to talk about, we talked about reforming the GME environment. And the good thing about it is many academics and more recently the IOM have come up with uh, you know, other ways of reforming, but they've tracked pretty carefully or pretty closely to the things that MedPAC said uh, many years ago. So maybe there's some uh, hope, but there is a lot, and we should talk about this on Q&A, which is if there are all these ideas floating around, if there's these people doing this kind of research, why doesn't anything change? And on Q&A, I think we should probably get into that. Anyway, I have a typical slide here. We're a congressional agency. We act independently. We support both sides of the aisle. We do analysis. We make recommendations to the Congress, that kind of thing. I think um, most people have a sense of who we are. We're very small, though, you know, uh, 35 uh, uh, people, person staff, and then I have 17 commissioners that um, I report uh, through uh, to the Congress. Okay, so I'm supposed to tell you about graduate medical education. Um, I don't consider myself an expert in these uh, matters, although I uh, come up to them every, every once in a while as our, our work comes up to it. But there's a little bit of history here that I think is important to keep in mind as you consider this issue. So, uh, you know, Medicare was created in 1965. The private sector was not interested in, in insuring, you know, elderly and ultimately disabled people because they actually use care, and so there was definitely a market uh, failure, and Medicare was created to try and, and address that. And as part of those discussions, people said, well, you know, we train physicians. Physicians are a public good. Shouldn't Medicare pay for that? And there was a decision at the creation of, of uh, Medicare, and ultimately as Medicare went through its payment uh, system changes, which I'll give you a feel for as we go forward, but the thought process was Medicare shouldn't be the only and permanent solution to this problem. If you think about this, this is a public good. You train a physician, a physician can see an uninsured person, a privately insured person, a Medicaid person, a Medicare person. They can also, and I believe Aaron was making this point at the end of it, they can also not see that person. You can publicly train from your paycheck every two weeks out of Medicare a physician, and then that physician, after he or she has received all of their training, can choose not to see a Medicare patient, as, as the case may be. And so some people said, you know, the way you should do this is create a fund or a trust fund that is about graduate medical education, and it's not connected to Medicare, it's not connected to GME, and fund the training of a physician because that's a public good. And then maybe that money should come from general revenue or a tax on insurers or something like that. But the main thing I want to do before I drag you through all the Medicare stuff, which is going to be incredibly interesting, is to keep you in mind, keep in mind there were other ways to approach this, and in fact, in the conference report that created it, they said Medicare should be a temporary solution and shouldn't be the only funding source for GME. It isn't, but it is the major game in town. Okay, so that's a little bit of history. Uh, so how does Medicare um, uh, uh, GME uh, work, graduate medical education work? So the first part of it that I want to get across to you has, is called direct graduate uh, medical education payments. This is $3 billion. And what this is is keep in mind the way graduate medical education has evolved is, and I'm starting to make some broader points here, is the money is all driven through the hospital, and the tr so ultimately $10 billion and drives out of Medicare through the hospital, and training programs consequently have historically been housed in hospitals. And that's going to become an issue that I'm going to uh, lay out for you. So we're talking about $3 billion that travels to the hospital, and this particular $3 billion does the following. When you're in a hospital and you have a training program, you have a bunch of interns and residents running around. Well, you have to pay them salaries, 
and then you have to have some administration to pay them and schedule them and make sure that what this training program um, actually works. And so you have a payment that is to cover the salaries and the administrative costs associated with that intern and resident. And let me just say this, and actually Erin had a nice slide, which, uh, which she took from the IOM. This is the process where the, the student has left medical school and now has entered a residency program in a largely in a hospital setting where they're getting trained by other physicians to do the thing that they have chosen to do, internal medicine, orthopedic surgery, whatever the case may be. Okay, so that's uh, the, the place in the education that we're talking about. Payment system works like this. There's a cost report from the hospital that says the per person cost of this intern and resident is X. There's a set of factors that you adjust that by based on whether the person is full-time or part-time. That's really determined by how long their residency program is. So if I have a four-year four residency program, I am full-time for that uh, four years. But if my residency program goes beyond five years, the, I'm full-time for that five years and then considered part-time for the remainder. So if I had a seven-year residency program, I would be considered part-time. So you have a dollar figure, you adjust by whether the person is full-time or part-time in any given year, and then you adjust that payment further by what proportion of the days in the hospital are Medicare versus total. And so in a sense, you're saying, I'm calculating how much it costs to support this resident, and then I'm adjusting it for their full or part-time status and how much Medicare represents in that hospital. And on net, $3 billion is spent this way through the hospital, to the hospital. Okay, everybody with me? Like I said, it's gonna be really interesting. <laughs> Okay, then there's a second concept called indirect medical education, and it works like this. So here's the, the, the intuition, if you will. It says, you know, if you teach someone, there's a certain inefficiency or cost to that. And I don't mean that in a pejorative way. If somebody, if your boss came to you and said, for the next two weeks, I want you to train somebody to do your job, you would be a bit less efficient at your job. You would be telling them why they do things. You would be showing them where to go and get information to do it. There would be a certain loss there in terms of you sort of trying to teach that person uh, to do things. And the intuition was, well, if you're running a hospital and you don't have a teaching program, you might have one cost. But if you're running a teaching program, then that would add a cost. And if you do an empirical analysis and kind of try to explain cost variation across hospitals, it turns out there is truth to that statement. And so the decision was made, and this is not a really good decision, the decision was made to say there will be an increased payment for every admission in a teaching hospital. There's about 1,000 teaching hospitals, two to 300 major teaching. The rest of them are called you know, other teaching or minor teaching. They don't like being referred to as minor, just mention that. Um, but uh, have smaller uh, teaching, teaching programs. And so every time an admission, occur, admission occurs in any of these teaching hospitals, Medicare is paying on average eleven dollars or $12,000 per admission, but there's an add-on in the teaching hospital. And these add-ons can be big. If you have a large teaching program, this can be a 30% add-on to every admission that occurs in your hospital. And the way the formula works is you have an intern and resident to bed ratio, and then you have a multiplicative factor that says, here's how much I'm gonna adjust each of your emissions based on the size of your uh, teaching program. This is the big money. This is six to seven billion dollars. This is the money people track on very carefully. Um, so uh, six and a half billion dollars here. Now, it turns out that IME page, uh, payments are set too high. And there's a couple of reasons for this. So in 1983, Medicare shifted from a charge and cost-based payment system to a prospective payment system, which is a session in itself. You're just going to have to trust me. We're going to move on. And in part of that, it said, okay, I'm going to do this adjuster and this payment adjuster that I just went, went through with you. <laughs> the empirical analysis suggested an add-on of about 6%. But at the time the legislation passed, it was arbitrarily doubled. And so basically, if the analysis said add this much on, twice that was added to it. 
over many years the legislation has kind of come back in and tried to lower that and from eleven and point eight to about five point five which is what the current multiplier is but we in the meantime have several times reestimated what that additional cost is and we believe the factor is still overstated by half it's now two point two percent so we think that of the six or seven billion dollars about half of that is not justified by the additional costs that the hospital is incurring. Now, let me just check my slide here. Um, what hospitals will say is, you know, teaching hospitals will say is, you know, they've not disputed this particular number, but what they'll say is, actually, what this money is for is my patients are more severe. And so you will hear this argument. What I want you to understand is, is in about 2008, we also did some work on severity. We recommended changes to the payment system to pay more accurately for more severe patients. Those payments were, or that, that was implemented. The teaching hospitals benefited from that change, and yet they are still getting this add-on. So you should be aware, because you will hear, hear that argument. Moving on. This is a summary slide. Um, so I've told you about direct GME, about $3 billion. This is to pay the resident's salary and the administrative costs. You have $6.5 billion on this indirect medical education uh, concept, the cost of having teaching while you're trying to provide care. We think about three of it, uh, about half of it is justified. The other half is not justified. I'm going to great pains to point out this number because that extra $3.5 billion is going to come back into the talk in just a minute, okay? So write that number down while you're marking excellent on your evaluation <laughs> forms. Okay. Um, oh, I already told you this. Yeah, this is a slide I was telling you. You'll hear the severity argument. I've, I got out of sequence there. Sorry, guys. This is a severity argument. I've taken you through it. There's now a severity adjuster in the payment system the teaching hospitals benefited from. Okay. Now, the next thing you're going to hear um, when, you know, people come to your offices, and I think Aaron's stuff becomes, you know, comes deeply into, into play here, is the first thing you're going to hear is, look, this is simple. We have a shortage. We need more physicians, and you need to increase the numbers of funded slots that are in GME, okay? And that's, that's all that needs to happen here. Now, of course, this costs money, and so you, I imagine you also have to pay attention to the deficit and the debt that this country is facing, but that's the basic argument. Right now, medic, there are probably, and Aaron probably knows this much better than me, there's probably 100, uh, 100 plus uh, uh, thousand slots in the country. Medicare subsidizes 90x of those, and then the hospitals, um, uh, pay, you know, just outright for another 10 to 15,000 uh, of those. So in other words, Medicare does limit the number of slots it subsidizes. And there's great pressure right now from the teaching industry to keep, uh, to, to increase those slots. There's a couple of reasons you should think very carefully about this beyond the fact that you have a deficit that you're facing. Number one, as Aaron has said, is there a shortage and I really appreciate her analysis, and you're going to see some stuff later that, that connects to it, because when we were going through this analysis, we were saying nobody's done with an objective point of view, an assessment of what the needs are, just the total number, but then what kinds of professionals, and if you have differences either in location or kinds of professionals, you might say even within the current um, subsidies, you might subsidize different specialties differently because you might not need a whole bunch of X, you may want some more of Y. The other thing to keep in mind is remember, the hospitals benefit from these interns and residents. You have a bunch of low cost labor running, all, highly educated low cost labor running all around your hospital. So as a government, how much you should subsidize that is a question because they're getting a benefit uh, from it. Some of these residency programs generate revenue, not all of them, but cardiology, orthopedic surgery, you talk to a, a CFO, 
those programs can actually generate net revenue uh, to the hospital. So again, if you have a scarce subsidy dollar, you should really be asking about where you target it. Um, so anyway, I think that's that particular slide. Okay, so now um, I'm shifting gears and I'm telling you less about uh, GME and Medicare and telling you about what MedPAC said to reform it a few years back. Now, a couple of points I want to just kind of start to get into your heads that you can agree or disagree uh, with. But the money drives through hospitals, and we think that that has resulted in residency programs that are highly focused on the inpatient setting when, in fact, care is moving out of the hospital. Surgery, e even in large, you know, percentages is moving out of the hospital. And think about the population in question here. We're talking about the elderly and disabled. You encounter these people in their home. You encounter these people in the office. You encounter these people in uh, uh, re rehab and nursing types of settings. And the training programs often don't reach to those uh, particular settings. We also think the training in those uh, programs is very focused on clinical care and not focused on other objectives like care coordination, working in teams, that uh, type of things. Um, so we think that this linkage to the, oh, and by the way, once the dollar, and Aaron made a, a quick reference to this, once the dollar hits the hospital, nobody knows what happens with that dollar. There is no accountability in Medicare to know did that dollar actually go to teaching. Once it hits the hospital, it can go anywhere salaries, building new things, buying equipment, whatever the case may be. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that Aaron said that they're trying to get some uh, accountability in Medicaid, which I've you know, stopped talking about because I've just lost that argument. Uh, but maybe I'll start talking about it again. Okay, another thing that we were concerned about, I made a quick reference to this, is curriculum. And so we did some work with RAND several years ago, looked at curriculums, and, and this is not high science and representative. We went to selected programs and just tried to look at what was going on and felt that there was curriculum that was being missed on coordination, working in teams, working uh, with IT, being aware of cost, working with quality metrics and trying to drive you know, patient care to a, a high quality outcome, that type of thing. And so we felt that this curriculum was, uh, or curric many curriculum across the country were lacking. And in a sense, the thought process goes like this. Everybody wants a reformed payment system that focuses on coordination, focuses on quality, and contains cost. And we're out here as policy people trying to change the payment system and measure quality. And up at the beginning of the pipeline, the training that's occurring doesn't focus on any of that, and then we suddenly have a professional that doesn't think about and work within a system like that. And so the thought process is get upstream and start to inject some of that into the training program. So, um, and I think that's what this slide just was about. Right, so you're looking for uh, coordination and reform, drive it upstream in the pipeline to try and start to build it into your graduate medical education uh, programs. Okay, we're coming to the finish line here, not too much more, so, you know, hang on. I know this is, like, really interesting, but, um, okay, this is kind of the big thing MedPAC said. This is the thing that just about everybody hates, okay? So you want to focus on this one. And then I, we have some technical things that come out um, uh, after this, and uh, one I think crosses nicely, or Aaron has nicely crossed over into, and I'm going to make that point. Okay, so the first recommendation we said is, look, the Congress should direct the Secretary to create a performance-based teaching program, if you will. So you, what you're looking for here are programs who inject this change in the criteria or curriculum into their programs, programs that are either located or encompass out-of-hospital training. When we were talking about this, there was a physician on the commission who said, I remember my first day of going to my office to be a physician. I realized as I sat in my office, I had never actually been trained to deal with this situation. All of my training was in the hospital. I was dealing with sick patients and complicated diseases and surgeries. And then I left and I sat in my office and I'm going to be a primary care physician. And I have never done this in my my training. And so the idea is to inject the curriculum changes into it 
and to inject more sites of care where the training occurs. So I'm training in a nursing home, I'm training in an outpatient clinic, I'm training in an office setting, that type of thing. We would set up a panel in order to advise the secretary about how to arrange these criteria, and we've written some of the criteria, at least objectives up, up in our reports, but this panel should not just be the graduate medical education community. It should also be insurers, obviously the provider uh, societies, beneficiaries. In other words, it was something like Aaron is saying where, well, we want accountability. There's certain value we want to extract from our education process if we're going to set up these criteria. Let's get input from everybody who's involved in that, not have the criteria set exclusively by the societies and the GME uh, accreditation organizations. You're starting to see why people were unhappy about this, I assume. Number two, the money doesn't just go to a hospital. If you set up a program that's not hospital-based, the money can travel to you. And the last point is, what money are you talking about? And I told you to write this down. I'm talking about the $3.5 billion that we think is actually too, paid too much as a multiplier. That block of money would, in a sense, be pulled aside and said it is only allocated to programs that meet these uh, criteria. Okay, into the finish line here. Um, we also said uh, you should give a report to the uh, GME um, uh, you know, community, if you will, detailing what dollars travel to, to their hospital for uh, DME, uh, direct and indirect graduate medical education, and the counts of uh, interns and residents. Um, I don't necessarily view the graduate medical education community broadly as for reform or change. There is a lot of entrenched uh, kind of behavior there. But there are people who say they're very frustrated by the fact that these dollars flow into the system and they don't particularly see them, that the dollars don't end up going to education. And we thought that this was a way at least to start a healthy conversation or, in Aaron's view, a hockey fight about where the dollar is that came in uh, to the hospital. And then finally, we have three studies, and I want to focus on, because we didn't feel like we were particularly the best, um, you know, uh, experts to do this. This is complicated stuff, and I'm very encouraged by Aaron's work. We said people need, and we felt that it was kind of a HRSA uh, responsibility, people need to start doing estimates of workforce needs and do it from a disinterested point of view and to use different assumptions. Are we talking about our current system or are we talking about a reform system that has a lot more focused on the, uh, you know, the professional like PA, NPs, and nurses and is much more, you know, team oriented. In that kind of environment, what do you need? And I think some of the stuff that Aaron's doing is, is starting to move in that direction. We also said there needs to be, and we tried to do some of this and with mixed success, which specialties are uh, revenue generators for hospitals, which specialties are not, because again, if you have limited dollars, you may want to support some types of uh, training and not others. And then finally, and this really exits into the uh, HRSA world, we found that the workforce, uh, there was real issues of diversity. A lot of the physicians in this country come out of families in the highest income uh, brackets. They often come from families where there are already physicians, for example. And we think there are issues both in terms of income diversity, race or ethnic uh, diversity, and urban and rural. And there are different ways that they try and capture people literally out of high school and get them into the pipeline that, you know, ultimately to end up in praxis. This is not Medicare's turf, but we commented on it that there are programs that exist in HRSA. I am no way an expert in that, but maybe that begins to segue into the last uh, uh, presentation. So thank you for that. <laughs>